I'm hoping to cover this material tonight. We started last week, the Noah Covenant, and um, I'm not sure what happened, but we, we didn't get very far. Let's pray. Father, bless the study of your word. This is a time of worship to you. We want your word to be precious to us in Christ's name. And amen. Promise in the clouds, the common grace covenant. The only thing we have to do in terms of review is to remind ourselves of the definition. On page two, we have the definition of the Noahic covenant and common grace. The Noahic Covenant is the covenant of common grace, the realm of our everyday lives under the sun. It broadcasts how God governs this world and preserves goodness so that life can truly be a blessed journey. Sometimes we neglect the study of this covenant because it is non-redemptive. God does not promise salvation in this covenant. Rather, he promises to preserve the natural order. And then the definition of common grace. Common grace is God's undeserved kindness to all people, no matter what their spiritual status. And so that gets us um, up to speed to where we need to be. We left uh, our study talking about the parties of the covenant. And again, remember, this is the first covenant of the five covenants that comprise the covenant of grace. Remember, there's the covenant of redemption, the covenant of works, and then the covenant of grace. Those are the three overarching covenants of the Bible. But under the covenant of grace, you have five sub-covenants. Next week, we'll talk about the covenant with Abraham, and then the covenant with Moses, the covenant with David, then the new covenant. All of these five covenants, including tonight, God's covenant with Noah, this makes up the covenant of grace, which provides for us a progressive revelation of God's salvation for us. And again, the Noahic covenant doesn't specifically talk about salvation, but we're going to see that Salvation can't come to us if the natural order has not been preserved. And so in an indirect kind of a way, the Noahic covenant speaks to us of salvation. It's a covenant that God makes with the earth. Isn't that something? It's a commitment God makes to the earth. It's a covenant God makes with everything on this planet, from animals to birds, it's God's covenant with mankind in general. And so that's where we left off, and now we continue as we talk about the sign of the covenant. Even the sign of this covenant emphasizes the commonness of this covenant. The covenants that God establishes they come with signs, and these signs help to sustain the covenant and administer the covenant. I mean, for example, we're going to learn that God's covenant with Abraham, there was a sign. There was a seal to that covenant, circumcision. And it belonged to those that were in that covenant, and that was just the Jewish people those that were a party to the covenant were able to enter into the sign of the covenant. When we talk about the new covenant, there are two signs, water baptism and holy communion. And notice that that's for people in the church. Those that are in that covenant partake of those signs of the covenant. And so look at the Noahic covenant. 
Who partakes of the rainbow? We all enjoy the sight of the rainbow. We all wonder at it. In fact, every time I'm on the road after a storm and there's a big beautiful part of a rainbow shining through the clouds, it's always the same. People are pulling over to look at it. They're so struck by the beauty of that, that sign in the heavens. And they pull over and they want to take time to look at it. I'm the same way because we don't see that every day and it is just so gorgeous. But notice how we all get to see the, the rainbow and enjoy it. Why? Because this is a common covenant. Therefore, it's a very unique covenant. It's God making a promise to everybody. What does this sign mean? Signs are symbolic, aren't they? We've emphasized that a few weeks ago, that the signs of the covenant are not empty symbols, though. In the new covenant, the signs are sacramental. They're means of grace. And so you don't separate the sign from the thing signified. When we're baptized, we can use that language. We're baptized into Jesus Christ. When we drink the wine and eat the bread, we're, we're drinking and eating the, the blood and body of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's power in a sign. What is the meaning of the sign of the rainbow? Well, you can see in the word rainbow, the word bow. In fact, in verse 13, God calls it my bow. Bow, as in bow and arrows. In ancient uh, iconography, uh, a victorious king in these ancient artistic pictures that celebrate icons, um, the victorious king, when he goes into battle, the bow is vertical, and sometimes the string is pulled taut. And there's an arrow in it signifying we're at war. There's hostility here. But when a king came back from battle, returning home with the victory, the pictures show the bow horizontal, the same kind of position as a, uh, it's the rainbow, horizontal, signifying the hostilities have ended, the battle is over. The victory is won. It's a symbol of peace. And so here we have the rainbow, a bow without an arrow. It's God saying that he's not hostile with the world right now. There is a peace. Now, we need to, to clarify something here. Um... Romans chapter 1 tells us that God's wrath is being revealed from heaven. Even now, God's wrath is being revealed from heaven. And how is that wrath being revealed? The wicked are being turned over to more perversity. God is letting people go down a course, a road of perversity, and, and get more and more wicked. And that's a form of God's judgment. But notice that God in the present, he is not aggressively, decisively pouring out the fury of his wrath on everybody. This isn't the day of God's judgment. And so he is showing peace. He's sending the word, the ministry of reconciliation, be reconciled to God. And so here's peace after the storm. Here's God's posture toward the world right now. Yes, the wrath of God does abide upon those who do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But today is, is a day of God being kind to his enemies. It's God being favorable to humankind. Even though they may not love God and worship God. 
He's not pouring out his judgment in the present time. And so here is a beautiful rainbow, a bow without arrows, a sign. And then look at the terms of the covenant. What guarantees the validity and the continuance of this covenant? What are the terms? I want you to notice that the sign identifies that it is a sign for God. Isn't that something? This rainbow is for God, verse 16. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. That's something for us to... Realize when we're gazing up at that beautiful rainbow and we're looking at the different colors and we're amazed at that artistic expression to realize that God is also looking at the rainbow. And as God looks at that rainbow, he's remembering his promise. He's remembering his covenant with us. And so the only term for the covenant to be kept is God's word. In other words, this covenant is unbreakable. There are no conditions we have to meet for this covenant to continue. Now, this is really emphasized in uh, Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 20 and 21. If you can break my covenant with the day... And my covenant with the night. You see, that's the Noahic covenant. God preserves the natural order, seed time and harvest, daytime, nighttime. God says, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that day and night will not come at their appointed time, then also my covenant with David, my servant, may be broken. Now, the point is this. God is emphasizing in this particular scripture that the Davidic covenant is unilateral. God is guaranteeing its future and its fulfillment. And he relates it to to the Noahic covenant and says, I mean, look at your experience. Has day ever forgot to show up? Has night ever forgot to show up? You know, they show up at the appointed time. God's covenant with Noah has never been broken. And so God says, my covenant with David also will never be broken. Notice it's an everlasting covenant. Now, isn't that surprising? Because Jesus said, the heavens and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. Why is God's covenant with creation everlasting? Because this present heaven and earth is going to be purified by fire and then out of that purification there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth so in one sense the heavens and earth will pass away the heavens and the earth in this polluted form in this cursed era that's going to pass away but the creation that God has made here it's not going to pass away God is always committed to this little planet and to the humanity that he's placed on this planet. So it's an everlasting covenant. And sometimes we wonder how amazing that is. The globe keeps spinning. Scientists can't really understand the glue that holds it all together. They will tell you that. They can tell you about atoms and molecules and all kind of metaphysical things. And, um, but there's a mystery of, of what keeps it all running and keeps it together. What's the glue that holds it all together? They really can't put their finger on that. And the answer is God promised it. So the planets don't get off their track and crash into each other. You know, Juniper and Saturn just kind of crash into each other and forget where they're supposed to go, what their path is all about. God is holding it all together. 
Colossians 1.17 says that Christ, in him all things consist. That's awesome. Now, what's so encouraging to us, and we really emphasized this last week, because there, there's such anxiety today, today, you know, are we going to destroy planet Earth? Are we polluting the atmosphere so much that we're going to just uh, suffocate the bombs we're building? China's now got super nuclear weapons, and we don't know what North Korea's doing, and we don't know what we're doing, and there's terrorism, and there's threat, there's wars, rumors of wars, and... There's anxiety about the future because of our atmosphere, our environment, and, and heat, and all of these things. But, but the beautiful thing of knowing the Bible is to know these covenants. We don't have the power to destroy what God has created. Now, that doesn't make us passive, where we don't care about the stewardship of our earth. We are stewards. But we do not have the power to destroy what God has created. And that's what this covenant is all about. Stop living in fear. God has a future for this planet and for humanity. And he's not going to fail us. This is God's covenant. God says, when I see that sign, when I see that beautiful rainbow, I will remember. I love that. Now, look at the ethics of the kingdom or the regulations of the, the covenant. Even though the covenant is rooted only in God's faithfulness to us. He's a promise keeper. Yet, we have responsibilities under the covenant. We have appointed activities. And God is preserving all things so that we can fulfill these mandates again our fidelity to these duties do will not determine the continuance of this covenant whether we're faithful or unfaithful to these duties this is an everlasting covenant and it depends on god and god alone but we have activities there's three main activities that we see in the covenant of verses 1 through 7 of Genesis 9. First of all, be fruitful and multiply. And so God sustains the order by um, mankind procreating, animals procreating. And this, of course, assumes marriage and family. Because now new life is nourished in that family situation and so procreation family life all of this is part of God's good human society the second thing is uh, Noah can eat all kinds of food that's in verse 3 now the distinction between clean animals and unclean animals and the ark that disappears when Noah gets off the boat isn't that something now it's a brand new situation. God is saying you can eat of all types of animals and plants. Now, when we get to the Mosaic Covenant, we're going to go back under a law that identifies clean and unclean. And then when Christ comes, he does away with that. But for this period of time, with Noah in the common covenant, we don't distinguish between uh, clean animals and unclean animals or, you know, bad plants, good plants. We can eat whatever is growing and grazing. We don't have to say, is this spiritual or not? We might want to ask the question, is it healthy? But not moral and spiritual. Now, this is important to emphasize this because... Every once in a while, and in fact, it's more than just every once in a while. It seems, like, it seems like frequently somebody rises up and they think they are on a crusade for God to tell everybody what they're supposed to eat and what they're not supposed to be eating. I'm serious. It wasn't long ago. A dear Christian was telling me what to eat and what not to eat and that this is God's voice. Don't eat bread. Don't eat bread. 
No, bread is, is not of God. We were never meant to eat bread. I said, what? And there was a long list of things we're not to eat. Man, we, we, if we're not careful, we're going to just get an ulcer, have an anxiety about what's on the table. Does this have gluten? I went to Dashin this morning, got a little little uh, breakfast bar, and it was all proud, a big uh, gluten free. I really don't care. And then there's some, you know, no carbs. And then there's, you know, I respect vegetarians. I always wonder. I ask vegetarians, are we allowed to eat animal crackers? But if you're a vegetarian, uh, God bless you, but I'm going to eat steak. I'm going to eat T-bone, ribeye, porterhouse. <laughs> this is the common covenant God makes with man. Now, I know we're to consult nutritionists, and I read diet books, and I try to study a little bit about what's healthy and what's not healthy, and I'm not an expert in these things, but nobody's going to just make me feel unspiritual for the way I eat. Nobody. And I remember one Wednesday night, I was feeling so anointed, and man, we had such a powerful service. This was, this was a few years ago. I told everybody, because my wife, she loves Krispy Kreme donuts, and that's her thing. And, and, and I think I had mentioned that in the sermon. And then, I, you know, it, it such a powerful time of the Lord at the benediction. I told everybody, I said, I'm feeling so victorious. I want everybody to go to Krispy Kremes and get a donut. And the next day, I got an email blasting me. How dare you encourage the people of God to get a Krispy Kreme donut? I didn't tell people to buy a dozen donuts. I read it in Proverbs 25 yesterday. Eat honey. That's dessert. That's sweet. That's sugar. Eat honey, but not too much or you'll vomit. It could say don't eat too much or you'll be overweight. I had to been in honor of my father. Uh, Monday will be his anniversary of uh, 10 years, his, his death. And... I'll be preaching about my dad this Sunday, but my dad loved to go, to go to Dairy Queen and eat a banana split. I went to Dairy Queen last night and got me a banana split. Now, let's see what Paul said in 1 Timothy 4, for everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. Don't let somebody take the joy out of what you're eating. And watch your weight. Everything in moderation. Pray. Of, now notice the spirituality of a meal that Paul is saying. Everything is, is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. In other words, eating isn't just a time of nourishing your body. It's a time of real gratitude to God. And that's why we pause and pray before we eat. Now, I'm not in the habit of saying a long prayer before I eat my meal. I'm hungry. I pray all day long. I know one young man, he was at the church picnic, and they were ready to eat the hot dogs that were coming off the grill, and a deacon got up to pray the blessing on the meal, went on and on and prayed for Japan and prayed for China and prayed for the lost and prayed for the church and went on and on. And this, <laughs> this young boy got his hot dog and... You know, it wasn't hot anymore. He said to that deacon, he said, you done prayed my hot dog cold. <laughs> well, it's not time to have a long prayer meeting when it's, you got food steaming on the table. But it's important to pause and to acknowledge God. It's a, it's a time to acknowledge God and his goodness and its abundance. Now, notice in this covenant that we can eat what grows and grazes. We can eat animals, plants of every kind. This is his blessing. It implies work. Because if you eat animals, if you eat vegetation, it implies you've got to be a tiller of the soil or a shepherd of herds. One or the other. Directly or indirectly, 
There needs to be cultivation and labor so that food can grow and we can partake. And so here is another thing in the covenant we are to work. Paul said if a man doesn't work, he ought not to eat. So work is not a four-letter word. It's a, it's a beautiful part of God's covenant with man. Of course, it was part of God's covenant with Adam. But now it's being renewed with Noah. The third thing, which is very fascinating, is government. God is preserving the natural order by what? Building family and have new life and procreation. He's preserving the order of nature by establishing work and labor through which we eat and enjoy the gifts of creation. And thirdly, he's preserving the natural order by establishing the state, by instituting civil government to what? Restrain evil. We talked about that last week, that the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from his operation of restraining and, and people went hog wild. All hell break loose, we said. And that's what, why there was such a depth of, of, of violence and evil. The spirit stopped restraining. But it's beautiful that here in the New Testament, there's all kind of restraint of evil. There's the Holy Spirit back restraining the mystery of iniquity. There's conscience and there's government. And then there's the power of the church. There's all kind of restraints that hold back the tide of iniquity where it would be such more, more of a wicked and violent world. And there's more peace than not peace. Um, I mean, I don't go into the mall. I, there was a, a shooting at a mall in uh, what, Idaho what, yesterday. But, but that made the news because it's rare. That's why it made the news, because it's rare. I don't walk into our mall and, and just fear, live in fear. Um, God has established restraints, and there's restraint now. Watch this. In the Noahic covenant, in terms of government, watch this now. This is fascinating. Government that is built on the principle of justice so that the person who harms another person deserves a proportionate penalty. Now look at chapter 9 and verse 6. This is formulaic. Blood for blood. That's what you read in chapter 9 and verse 6. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man his blood shall be shed. Now notice this scripture is taking it now to the extreme crime of murder. So it says blood for blood. But that sets the pattern for all justice that it's proportionate penalty. And so later in the Bible, you read an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a wound for a wound. And the whole idea is there is to be justice and this justice is to be fair and reasonable. Um, now, notice something else about the foundation of government. Because now later, Paul will talk about the, the duty of government to punish wrongdoers and to reward those that do well. You see that in Romans 13. You see that in 1 Peter chapter 2. Paul talks about the government bearing the sword. Bearing the sword, the power to punish, the power to enforce law by instilling fear, the fear of punishment. This is what God sets up to bless us, to restrain evil. Now, notice a deeper thing here in verse 6 of, of what, what constitutes a healthy government. It's simply respect for human life, respect for people. Notice what he says, uh, by man's blood he shall shed. 
because he's made in the image of God. Verse 6 talks about the image of God. Just laws, a, a just society, it's all rooted simply in this one idea, we respect people. People are given respect. Nobody is diminished. And if you're in the minority, we can't, somebody else can't take advantage of you. That's why we have the Bill of Rights. So that those that aren't in the majority, they're protected with rights. Why do they have rights? We have rights because of our Creator. It's respect for people. The word respect literally means to look twice. Spect, like spectacles, um, glasses, spectator. Spect means to look. Re means to repeat. When you respect somebody, you look at that person twice. Sometimes if you look at the person, the first time you just see something outward, and there's a prejudice, there's hostility, there's, there's a, you're, you're, you're not looking deep, you're just looking outwardly, and, and you, you have a conclusion You look the second time, and you look and see that person is made in the image of God. That lady, she's made in the image of God. This is a a person who is an image bearer of God. Here's a picture of God. Here's a, a revelation of God in this person, at least to some degree. The image has been defaced and marred. But the image of God. What respect. And when we respect people, then government's able to think right and have laws that are fair and life is protected and justice is established, etc. But but it's all right here in the Noahic Covenant. It's all right here. Here's government punishing Those that injure others, promoting justice and protection of people, protection of life. And we'll talk about more about this in just a moment. The Noahic covenant, then, is a common covenant to preserve society. It's not redemptive. It's not promising salvation to everybody. This is not universalism. This is God's kindness to his enemies, God's kindness to everybody, God's goodness. The earth is filled with his glory. We all partake of the goodness of God. In him we live and move and have our being. This is not a redemptive covenant. Yet, it serves the other covenants that are redemptive. This covenant Actually, yes, it talks about family, the workplace, and government. Three big things that society is comprised of. But this covenant serves a higher purpose because Genesis 3.15 is the promise of the seed, the seed of woman, a champion seed who will step on the devil's head and destroy the head of the serpent, and take away the curse, and overcome all the powers of evil. How wonderful. The seed of woman. Well, there's got to be an arena for that seed to come forth. There's going to be a battle, Genesis 3.15 says. There's going to be conflict between the seed of serpent and the seed of the woman. There's got to be a boxing ring for that battle to take place. There's got to be a nation so that that seed can come forth in the fullness of time. And so, God preserving society is preserving life. I mean, think about it. If God had destroyed everybody, the antediluvian world destroyed everybody with the flood, including Noah and his family, that promise never would have come. The seed never would have come because there would have been no seed. It would have been wiped out. But God is holding everything together because 
the seed was to come, and it did come. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Now notice, watch this, made under the law, made of a woman in the fullness of time. It was providential that the seed came in that time of history under the Roman Empire. Why? Rome, though it was cruel and pagan, it was all about peace and order through the enforcement of law. They call it Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Because they crushed their opposition. They were cruel. But you see, they, they ruled with a rod of iron. They enforced law. You didn't mess with Rome. There were crosses lined up on the main highway of those that rebelled against Rome, and they were crucified. This is what we do to you if you oppose our authority. There was law and order. They built roads. That's what government does. They build roads. They, they, they promise safety for their citizens. And Rome took in the Greek culture called Hellenization to bring forth a common language so everybody pretty much spoke the Greek language. Now look at how God used the government that was established through the Noahic Covenant, how he used Rome to maximize the start of Christianity. You can't start a church when there's a lot of chaos and bloodshed and fussing and fighting going on in society. That's why Paul says, pray for your government leaders so that we can live peaceful, quiet lives. There was order. And therefore, the focus could be on the birth of the church. There was one language enforced by Rome so that you could communicate the gospel to everybody. And there were highways built. Paul walked those highways and preached the gospel all over the world. He could get on boats and sail without being molested because he was a citizen of Rome and he had rights. There are times he was beat up and he said, wait a minute, I'm a citizen of Rome. I don't want that punishment right now. And they had to back off. It promoted the gospel, the birth of the Christian church. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Ha. <laughs> That's the Noahic Covenant. That's the fruit of the Noahic Covenant, the Roman Empire. A government. Justice. Order. Law. And God used that to bring his son into the world and to birth Christianity. And so, even though the Noahic Covenant is not uh, redemptive, it serves the other covenants that are redemptive. So we go a little bit deeper right now, and we see from the Noahic Covenant some basic truths about government, civil magistrates. I call this the contours of a political theology. First of all, government is legitimate. Civil government is legitimate. By this I mean that civil government has a right, even an obligation to carry out its proper work. And that work is simply to promote justice. Now God is the ultimate source of this legitimacy. Romans 13 and 1, except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God Every government that exists, Paul says it's legitimate because God is the author of this structure so that magistrates are called servants of God, ministers of God. We're to honor them. We're to submit to them. We're to pay our taxes. We're to pray for them. Government is legitimate. We're not to be anti-government. We're not to mock government leaders. We're not to be afraid of government. Oh, my goodness, government. It's the devil, the Antichrist. No, it's not. This is God working. God blessing us. 
government is legitimate. It's rooted in the Noahic covenant. Secondly, government is provisional. By provisional, I mean something set in place for a limited time and purpose until something greater arrives. It's important, the institution of government, but it does not endure forever. It's valuable, but it's not our highest value. Only one thing remains, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that kingdom right now is established within the Christian church. Kingdoms come and go. Gibbons has that famous book, The Rise and Fall of Civilizations. He, he describes seven, 21 civilizations that rose up and blossomed and then crashed. Kingdoms come and go. Empires rise and fall. We're not to get too excited about the political landscape. I get a little concerned that some Christians seem to be a little more excited about current affairs than what's going on with their local church. They're a little more passionate about uh, Fox News and fighting with CNN, and they get all caught up and obsessed with these things. Again, we're to care, we're to be involved. We'll see that in just a minute. But our allegiance is to be to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our passion is to be for the eternal things of God. Everything in this world is, is passing away. And so Paul writes to the church of Philippi, they were proud because they were Roman colony, and Paul says, you know what, your citizenship is in heaven. And then Paul said to the church of Colossae, seek those things that are above, set your affections on things above, not on things of this earth. We're sojourners here. We're exiles here, says Peter. This is not our home. We have no lasting city here, but we seek one to come. But we can get so ab absorbed in the affairs of this world. And even Paul says something interesting as he refers to the Noahic covenant in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He, he says, you know, even marriage you're to be excited about your husband and wife, but not too excited. You're to be excited about your job and do a good job, but don't get too excited. He says, because the present form of this world is passing away. There, there's got to be a certain detachment to everything in the Noahic covenant. Because that form will pass away. Again, it's an everlasting covenant because everything's going to be made different in the new heaven and the new earth. But the present form is passing away. It's provisional. Government is provisional. The church is forever. And then government is common. Meaning it's for all sorts of people. It's not for some sorts of people rather than other sorts. Justice under human government is not to discriminate based on religion or ethnicity. They are to be discerning. Government is to be discriminating in one respect, knowing good from evil, therefore they can administer the sword, the justice. But that moral judgment is inseparable from cultural background and religious convictions. Government is not to ever discriminate. And so government doesn't sponsor a particular religion or favor a particular race or ethnicity. Government is for everybody to find justice and peace. When the saints of the Old Testament found themselves in high positions outside of Israel, they did not use their power to turn their communities into holy theocracies. 
Joseph, as the prime minister of Egypt, did not try to stamp out Egyptian religion and enforce only the worship of Abraham. He didn't do that. Daniel, when he was promoted to the third of the kingdom in Babylon and then meet a Persia, he did not push politically that you can only worship Jehovah God. He didn't try to turn Babylon into the new Jerusalem. God ordained civil government to be common to administer justice on behalf of all people within that jurisdiction. They're not to, meant to discriminate against people on the basis of their ethnic or religious identities. <laughs> Number four, government is to be accountable. Pol political life is not morally neutral. It is not. Policies come forth, and they have a moral tincture to them. Again, not a morality tied to a religious identity. Now, the question is this. If government is to be common to where everyone of diversity in that realm is treated with justice, and they have the liberty to carry out their religious convictions and worship according to the dictates of their conscience and to live by their values, and that's not controlled, coerced, or suppressed. The question is, how can you have a government that is common and justice prevails, and yet there's all this diversity? And the answer to that is what you find in the Noahic Covenant. Here's the secret. This goes deep. Man is made in the image of God. That's verse 6 of Genesis 9. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> in the natural order, in the natural order, since we're made in the image of God, see, some people don't know they're made in the image of God, but it doesn't matter. We are made in the image of God. Therefore, we have a moral discernment. We have a moral discernment. It just comes with our nature. There is an objective moral standard to which we all understand. C.S. Lewis will demonstrate that in his book, Mere Christianity. It's not cultural taboos. There are moral standards that are universal. Betrayal is always bad. Hypocrisy is always bad. Rape is always bad. There's no society that has ever said that's good. Cowardice, it's always bad. Because we're made in the image of God, we have the ability to carry out justice in government. Conscience, it's called. Reason. So Romans chapter 2, Paul talks about those that don't have the, the word, that don't have the law. They, they're not under, they've never got a part of the Mosaic covenant to know the law. That's all right. Because Paul says they're still accountable because of what's written in their hearts, the law of God through nature being made in the image of God. Now what does that mean? For even America with diversity, because we believe in freedom of religion, and we should. Muslims can build their mosques. Jehovah's Witness can build their kingdom halls. Mormons can do their thing. Demon worshipers can do their thing as long as they don't, you know, throw eggs at my house. We believe in that freedom of religion. We believe in diversity of culture. We're not... A melting pot in America. That's a wrong picture. Oh, we're a melting pot. No, if it's a melting pot, you get into this melting pot and you lose your distinctiveness and history and I, a beautiful special identity. We're not a melting pot. We're a salad bowl. 
and you have a beautiful tomato, you have a beautiful pepper, you have a beautiful piece of lettuce, etc. We're celebrating. We believe in the preservation of, of diversity, different cultures, honoring different histories, different religions, allowing that. And so how can, in America, watch this. I'm going to get practical now as I have to close in five minutes. How do we promote justice legislatively when we don't preach the Bible to society? We preach the Bible to the church. But we're, we're not imposing the Sermon on the Mount on society. We can't even live by the Sermon on the Mount. How do we have just laws in America if not everybody believes in thus saith the Lord? What's well, easy? It's called natural law. Natural law. Reason. Conscience. A sense of fairness. A respect for people. We want to be respected. See, it's not hard to know that we have to respect people. We want to be respected. Two examples of this. When I was um, uh, a master's student at University of North Alabama, my instructor, Dr. Roberts, asked me to write a paper on abortion to take a position, and Tim, don't use the Bible. I said, I have no problem with that. I can take a position without using the Bible. I wrote a 30-page paper arguing against the practice of abortion and the uh, legalizing of abortion. I wrote a 30-page paper against it, documented footnotes all over the place, got an A+. Plus. My teacher didn't agree with that position, but he said it was an amazing paper, and we we go to lunch together, breakfast, he and I were friends. I never once quoted a scripture. Now, you can make a case against abortion by preaching the Bible. That'll work. But what if, you don't, if people don't believe in the Bible? It's natural law. In my paper, I have it in my office right now, 30-page paper. I'm thinking about publishing it. It's a great paper. I argue my case based on natural law. The good of society, history, biology, conscience. Dr. Albert Moeller, he's one of the great theologians of the Baptist Church, one of the greatest. I picked up his book the other day. He wrote a book defending traditional marriage, that it's a man and a woman, that it's, you know, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. He wrote a book defending traditional marriage, and he wrote it for society. He didn't write it for the church, so he didn't quote the scripture. He didn't refer to the Bible. The thick old book arguing against same-sex marriage it was all based on natural law, reason, biology, conscience, the good of society, history. Now, I want to tell you this. When a society, when a government violates natural law, they come under judgment. They don't come under judgment for disobeying the Bible. We do in the church. That's where we get in trouble. We hear Timmy preach and then we do something else. Or sometimes Timmy preaches and don't practice what I preach. Then I'm in trouble. No, no, no. Society's different. They're under judgment if they violate natural law. Things they know is right and wrong. But they cave into perversion and pressure, and they don't maintain God's natural order. 
In the Old Testament, give me two more minutes. In the Old Testament, most of God's judgment was to his redeemed people, the theocracy, Israel, which is likened to the church today. God dealt with Israel different from other nations. They were judged for idolatry. They were judged for all kinds of things. They got bad judgment because judgment begins at the house of God. Peter said that. Now watch this. God brought judgment to many other pagan Gentile nations, but not based on their idolatry. He didn't demand that they give up idolatry. They didn't even know about true worship. He did not judge them for the idolatry. He judged them for crimes against humanity. You see it in the book of Amos. Why were the Gentile nations judged? Ripping pregnant women open. That's pagan nations. God said, you're in trouble. That's against conscience and against natural order. Digging up the bones of kings and desecrating them. He says, that's a judgment. That's against natural order. You don't dishonor your history and leaders. You know that's wrong. You don't need my Bible to know that's wrong. They were judged for breaking treaties, promises with other nations. You know that's wrong. You don't want to be lied to. They were judged for slave trading. God said, you know that's wrong. You don't need my Bible and my theocratic people, my redeemed Israel, to tell you that's wrong. You know that's wrong. You don't own people and trade them and enslave them. I'll judge you for breaking natural laws. It's very interesting as I close. In Genesis 20, <laughs> here is a pagan king, Abimelech, pagan. Hadn't been to church, hadn't been to Bible, college, VBS, hadn't been to Calvary Gospel, doesn't know anything about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Of course, Isaac and Jacob wasn't born yet, but Abraham went down there. Now, Abraham had, I got close. I'm closing with this, I promise. Abraham had a problem. He had a good-looking wife. When you're in love with a beautiful woman, you watch your back. I love that hymn. Abraham was insecure. He had a good-looking wife, Sarah. And so he was always lying. The man of God goes down into Egypt and tells Abimelech, ah, oh, that's my sister. Well, it was like a sister, I don't know, some kind of a relative, but still it was his wife. It was deception. That's my sister. So Abimelech is making plans to bring her into the palace. And God comes to him in a dream and says, She's married. That's all God said. She's married. You dead man. She's married. Now watch this. Abimelech starts preaching to Abraham. Abraham's the patriarch. Abimelech's a pagan. But this is what Abimelech said. This is wrong to take a man's wife. That's a pagan preaching? This is evil to violate and to follow a man's wife. I fear. Why did you put me in this position? Hey, here's a man who, who never been to Sunday school. He has conscience. There's natural law. Abimelech is made in the image of God. It's clear to him what's right and wrong. And he knew he was violating natural law. And he's given the preacher, Abraham, a lesson why did you put me in this position and lie to me? First of all, dude, it's wrong for you to lie to me. And then to lie about your wife? And I almost took her? You see, we don't have to have this book to know right from wrong. We have natural law. Government is not built on Scripture. It's built on natural law. <laughs> and 
And when governments violate natural law, and I'm afraid America's going down a road. Well, obviously, we are going down a road of breaking natural law. And I want to say, make it very clear before I'm done. No, because I'm going to break my promise. I said I, was, I'm, I promised you I was going to be done with that story of Abimelech, and now I'm breaking a promise. And I'm talking about God who's the promise keeper. So thank you, Lord. I repent of my sins. Bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen.